Welcome to the Booth Library Podcast. This is our episode where we will be talking about the media section on the fourth floor media section over by LTS. My name is Joseph Morris, and I uh, dwell in the basement where I am continuously haunted by the ghost of Mary J. Booth. And with me today, my co-host, Logan Braddock, LTS section, fourth floor, complete opposite of Joseph. So I'm up at the top of the uh, structure, that is. He's at the top of the heap, everybody. Yeah. (laughs) And our special guest today is... I'm David Bell. Uh, I am a librarian in the Research, Engagement, and Scholarship Department, formerly known as Reference. I'm glad I got that all out. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm, I'm a, a public service librarian. I help people with research, and I uh, also uh, teach uh, research instruction classes. And I'm the subject librarian for uh, theater, journalism, English, and uh, sports. So um, I'm really interested in doing this uh, discussion about uh, film today because it's kind of right up my alley. Nice. Yeah, yeah. You've got you've got one of the the weirder because I order books for the subject librarians, and Dave's got one of the more interesting um, slices of the pie because it's like theater and sports and four other things. Yeah, and uh, the sports thing is kind of an anomaly because I'm not much of an athlete myself, um, although I I uh, I was a swimmer in high school. I don't know why I'm going into all that, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, um, I've actually I've been curious about this. I'm like, how did how did Dave but, uh, end up with theater and sports? Well, here's how it happened in 1999 when I started working here. The person who was doing it had left, oh, and well. it was assigned to me, and uh, it never got on all, all, ever since. <laughs> here you go, David. And I've learned a lot of stuff, and uh, I uh, I have fun uh, uh, selecting the books and materials for that area. But my real uh, sort of credentials are. Uh, expertise are in uh, literature and, and theater. Cool. All right. So like I said, today we'll be talking about the media section on the fourth floor. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a fairly impressive collection of DVDs and CDs and all sorts of other cool stuff on the fourth floor over by the LTS desk out by the fishbowl. And these, if you are an EIU student or you have a library card with us, these are free. Free, free, free. Free, yeah. free, free. So, um, of course, right now we are in rather extraordinary circumstances, unfortunately, um, with the current pandemic. So, used to be you could wander around and, and look at everything and touch everything. Put what? your grubby mitts on anything. Put your grubby mitts on everything. Now you can't really do that. So, if you want to check out anything from our media section, you do at at this exact moment in the space time continuum. You need to look it up online and then basically get a member of our LTS staff, such as Logan here. Come up, ask me what you're looking for. I'll go and get it, and then we'll uh, do the checkout process. Oh. So, um, looking up movies, if you're unfamiliar, you can go to the booth website, um, and then there's a tab that is uh, books and movies. Uh, look up the title you're looking for. You don't have to have the specific title. If you want an actor or specific director, you can put those in, and then uh, it should come up with the different movies. And select that, and I'll give you a call number. And just a librarian uh, note real quickly, we have a new online catalog search interface Alma, Alma. And uh, so if you've used the library's uh, online searching before, it'll look different. But uh, this is a new system that the Carly Consortium that we are part of, and uh, it should be much more user-friendly. If you're looking for a movie, you can select things by format. And, of course, we have movies in uh, streaming formats through many different platforms. We also have DVDs. Um, you just search for a title or the name of a director or an actor or something like that. You'll find uh, things in many different formats. And TV shows, which we will yeah. talk about quite at length here in a bit. Um, some other things that we usually have is uh, in front of the desk, we usually have kind of a theme that we're going with for the month or yeah, the we quarter. Have, we have displays for um, new material. New materials are usually displayed out front as well as usually we'll have like student picks. So we have student workers up at the LTS desk. 
So we'll ask them their favorite movies and have them shown for you guys. As of this point, we're not going to have those out front. Again, sur- special circumstances, everybody. It, we all know what we're going through right now. There's usually seasonal displays. There's usually like around Halloween, we bring out all the horror movies and put those on display. Um, summer movies around summertime. And In anticipation of Comic-Con, we had uh, comic book movies and display. Uh, right. So yeah, usually those are up. We are not having those up at this time though. If you would like to request, if you if you go through our catalog, our massive catalog of DVDs, and you don't find that one thing that you want, how can you um, contact Steve Brantley at all hours <laughs> of the night or day? Put up the Steve beacon. Put up the Steve signal. I love that. Contact Steve Brantley. He, he loves it. Yeah. Just just show up at Steve's house, knock on his door, be Bang like, on it, Steve. Give me DVDs. <laughs> um, but yeah, how, how do you go about, about uh, ordering, or not ordering, um, requesting stuff so that I can eventually buy it and then send it to John and John will send it out to the fourth floor? So you're going to go to the Booth uh, Library website there on eiu.edu and then you're going to go to Services and then under Services tab, there's going to be a request form. We're also going to put the link in this uh in this podcast. Nice. As soon as we figure out how to do that. That's right. I'm hoping someone more technically skilled than me is in charge of that aspect of this podcast. <laughs> so we have pretty much always added any movie that if someone has requested a movie yeah. the library doesn't already own. Yeah, we're pretty we'll, we're pretty we'll cool about it. Collection. There for a while someone was uh, making sure all of our superhero movies were up to date. So we were getting a bunch of those requests and I was like, yes. Me and Logan and Dave all have our top five um, movies, DVDs, CDs, whatever, that are available here at Booth Library in the media section. But I also sent out a bounce list email to our colleagues to see what they like from our collection. And I got I got some answers. Uh, mostly all ladies. Dudes, you slept on this one. I don't know what's up with, with our male employees. Come on. So, okay, Ellen Corrigan over in cataloging, she has, she apparently recently got Wonder Shows in, which for those of you who don't remember this little gem, it was, I think it was on MTV or Comedy Central, I can't remember which, and it was an adult kids show. It was designed, it was like a parody of kids shows, but it was made by adults for adults, and it was really messed up and really funny, um, and they had a, a segment called uh, Beat Kids. Because it was kids on the street, kids on the beat, beat kids. And um, they had these little kid reporters that would like interview people and they'd say terrible. <laughs> they'd ask these like terrible questions to adults and the adults would freak out and it was a great time. So that was Ellen's pick, Wonder Shows. Anybody ever watch that show? I have not seen that. I haven't heard of it, but I, I want to see it now. <laughs> look for it. But it is in our TV section. Um, Sarah Johnson had Downton Abbey, which my wife agrees with that wholeheartedly, Sarah. Anybody, you guys do Downton Abbey? I did. I watched Downton Abbey. I was not an early um, uh, viewer, but uh, it bec- it was popular, talked about so much for so long that uh, maybe in like in the third or fourth season, I thought, oh, maybe I should watch this. And I, I got the DVDs and started at the beginning. Yeah, see, uh, I, I understand the, because I watched a little bit of it with my wife, I understand the appeal of it, but I'm such a, uh, I'm such a dirty rabble rouser that I couldn't stand like the British class system at all. I just wanted to strangle all the people, all the rich people. <laughs> so not the show for me. Deb Fenneman gave me a pretty good list. She likes Married to the Mob, Raising Arizona, The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, which I've never heard of, My Favorite Wife, and Burn After Reading. So she had two Coen brother films on her list Ooh. for those of you paying attention. Raising Arizona is a great film. I wasn't as into Burn After Reading, but but Raising Arizona is is fantastic. I think I've seen them. Both. Well, I know I've seen them both. I don't remember them very well, honestly. I just remember Brad Pitt in that silly workout. <laughs> yeah, Brad Pitt's in a silly workout outfit and accidentally gets shot in the he gets shot in the head, <laughs> and out of nowhere, and you're like, wait, Brad Pitt's dead. <laughs> It's one of those things, you, you know, when you're like watching a movie and the character you think is like one of the main characters just up and dies like before even the third act. And you're just kind of sitting there going, wait, what? That was that was it. 
Uh, Michelle McDaniel from our BTC section um, has the TV show Psych, and apparently she has The Lion King rented permanently from our library. Um, shame, shame. And uh, apparently around Christmas, she rent, she checks out Handel's Messiah on CD so she can listen to it on her drive to, I think, her parents' house. I didn't write down all the notes. The The TV show Psych is really good if you guys have never seen it. Um, it's about a, it's a detective show, but the hook is the main guy pretends to be a psychic. He's not, but he's pretending to be. So half of the show is like, you know, detective work and half of it's just his ridiculous fake psychic routine. So. Jana from Circulation has the Bob Marley album Legend, uh, the Cranberries album Everybody Else Is Doing It, and the Tom Petty Anthology. She gave us some CDs. We have a really good CD section. If you still rock old school media, um, it's worth checking out. And then Arlene just said anything with Tom Hanks. So I'm sure we have plenty of movies with Tom Hanks. Wilson! I, I'm a continual, tr- I, I'm a contrarian by nature. So because everyone else loves Tom Hanks, I instinctively don't. So this, <laughs> this is why I'm, I'm sighing and making grumbling noises right now. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm wrong about this. Tom Hanks is a cool guy. I'm just cranky. I just so. hope that it never comes out that he's actually secretly a terrible monster. Yeah. So many people would be crushed. I know. It, I think it might break the space-time continuum. Forrest Gump would be ruined. Yeah, every, a lot of movies would be ruined. People love his stuff. So, okay. Now let's get to the, let's get to the nitty-gritty, and we got plenty of time. So uh, we are going to do our top five picks from the media section. And I think the way we'll do this is... We'll do it. We'll do round robin. So Logan, you do your number five, then I'll do my number five, and then Dave, you do number your number five, and we'll we'll keep that going until we've exhausted our selections. So Logan, what is your number five pick? My number five pick is the movie Zodiac. Ooh, I never watched that one. So Zodiac is a film by David Fincher. He's one of my favorite di- directors. Um, he's done. Social Network, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the U.S. version. Um, I just love his work. Zodiac has got Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., and Mark Ruffalo. So you got two Avengers in there. Yeah, no, that's a pretty stacked cast. And it is about the Zodiac killings that happen, um, I believe, in the 70s in California. And so it just kind of follows the, uh, the search for the Zodiac killer. And it is a great film. Robert Downey Jr. is classic Robert Downey Jr. And Jake Gyllenhaal, who I'm not a big fan of, but he is fantastic in this film. He seems to vary depending on the movie. He's incon- he's inconsistent. And it features my favorite drink, the Aqua Velva. <laughs> I don't know what. That sounds like a shaving cream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um I decided to do something a little odd for my fifth pick just to kind of show the breadth of stuff we have. Over in the art section, we have a whole section of DVDs on art and artist. There is a DVD called Cosm, C-O-S-M, and um, it features Alex and Allison Gray, who are a couple of crazy old hippies who have done way too many drugs. And um, Alex Gray has made all of this really amazing tripped out artwork and the dvd is about um he's got this thing called the cathedral of sacred mirrors or cosm for short which is like an art gallery slash religious temple rolled into one and uh, the dvd is like a sort of a exploration of this space that he's created and it's really good and if you're into trippy stuff um, check it out you'll hear trippy stuff a lot on my picks (laughs) All right, Dave, what's your number five? Uh, okay, I should start out with the uh, explanation of what I, how I did what I did. Um, I know we're supposed to pick uh, our top five favorite movies, but I just couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's did, got a plan. I, uh, I decided to do an Eastern tie-in. So these are ah. all movies that have some connection to Eastern. Someone um, who was either in, uh, from Charleston or went to school at Eastern is involved in these movies. All right. And um, I also don't have them in any really particular order. I just, think they're all great movies. Just pick one. So I'll just start with the 
Um, the first one is uh, Ball of Fire, which was a 1941 uh, Howard Hawks directed movie starring Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck. Hmm. And it's uh, it's a really cute um, comedy um, about uh, these. Uh, it's like this house uh, full of like little old professors who have been commissioned to write um, an encyclopedia by some wealthy millionaire. So he puts them all in a house and gives them a, 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 fills it with books and makes it a giant reference library. And their job is to uh, <laughs> gee, why does all of human knowledge. <laughs> Why, do, why does Dave like this Why film? would I like this? I Gee, know. I don't know. <laughs> what a weird so concept. It's a movie about a bunch of librarians <laughs> forced into a library to make a big library book. To sorry. make the, sorry, Dave. the best <laughs> compendium. No, that's good. I, I want to I make it a discussion. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, so one of the uh, little old professors is Harry Travers, who people will know as Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and he's great in it. And um, the Eastern or Charleston, Illinois connection is cinematographer Greg Toland, who was born and lived in Charleston uh, for the first few years of his life. And some of his uh, family are still in the, in the area. But he became a, a big cinematographer in Hollywood in the 20s and 30s. He died in 1948, I think, very young at age 44. But... Uh, in his uh, adult life, he was a, a major cinematographer, most well known for being uh, Orson Welles' cinematographer on Citizen Kane. Oh wow! So that, he's a, that's a good credit to he's have. He's a big guy in the uh, in the mid twentieth century or yeah. early to mid twentieth century um, Hollywood, um, and his work is amazing. It's you know the movies are all black and white, and right. uh, the the work he does with the focus and um, and contrast and light is amazing. Yeah. So it's worth watching his movies just to see how he does that. But this is also a really fun uh, comedy. And uh, so Gary Cooper plays um, sort of the leader of these uh, nerdy professors. He's kind of the handsome ringer in the, right. in the group. Right. There's, a, there's always um, got to be one. Um, and Barbara Stanwyck plays a gangster's uh, girlfriend who uh, has to hide out uh, from the... <laughs> authorities and ends up uh, uh, in this house with these nerdy nerdy dudes and of course she and uh, Gary, uh, Gary Cooper fall yeah. in love. And, oh yeah they do. Um, it, it's it's very fun and the movie this is kind of a twofer because uh, Bill, uh, Billy Wilder uh, wrote the screenplay and uh, oh, cool. Howard Hawks the director remade it in 1948 with the you know, basically the same outline Oh, I forgot to mention Ball of Fire also has uh, Gene Krupa and his orchestra, the famous uh, big band drummer. Oh, okay. Um, and he's in it too, and they do it. Uh, Barbara Stanwyck does a great uh, musical number with the orchestra and everything. So anyway, I'm, uh, uh, music is a big part of these movies too. So oh, yeah. The, the remake in 1948 is called The Song is Born, and that one stars Danny Kay. Virginia Mayo, and then a lot of uh, musical big names from that era, Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Louis Armstrong. Um, and that 1948, uh, Greg Toland also was the cinematographer on that one. Oh, wow. And that was also the year he died, so it may have been the last movie he worked on. Oh, cool. So anyway, it's not just, uh, you know, sort of a corny old movie. It's uh, it's uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty entertaining for, you know, it holds up even though, um, the 40s uh, had a different vernacular. Right. And, and, and encyclopedias don't exist anymore. <laughs> oh, and the, the reason the, the, all the little professor guys wanted, and they decided they have to get out of the house uh, because when uh, the Barbara Stanwyck character comes in, they realize they don't understand modern slang. Oh, yeah. I'm doing air quotes, which you won't. Yeah, you can't see those. <laughs> can't see the air quotes. Yeah. Um, but uh, they, they decide that they have to get out in the world um, so that they can write the section of the encyclopedia on contemporary lingo and right. slang. So anyway, it's a cute movie. Do, do they go Do they go bowling or mini golfing at any point? Uh, they go They go for a road trip, which is kind of yeah. interesting. See, that would be the 40s equivalent. Because, yeah, yeah, if it was an 80s movie, they'd either go bowling or play mini golf or something like that. 
with a with a nice little poppy tune in the background. But yeah, it's, it's sort of it's a it's a road trip with that old car with the old guy whose driver's license has been expired for thirty years. Nice. That sounds pretty good, actually. I think it's interesting that we complain a lot. I complain a lot about how many remakes are made nowadays. But something I've found out over the last few years, I guess Hollywood has always done this. Like they've always like I think uh, some directors would remake their own films if after like five or ten years. Right, and this one you could see why um, Howard Hawks would want to remake it after uh, like eight eight or nine years because it was such a great vehicle um, for these stars. The right, whole, the whole concept of it. All right, Logan, number four. My analysis is nowhere near as in depth as David's is. <laughs> My criteria is these are movies I like to watch and enjoy watching them. I may have gone a little overboard. It's all, <laughs> it's all good. It's awesome. It's, it's all good, man. I like it. <laughs> so my number four is a comedy, and it is The Royal Tenenbaums by oh, nice. Wes Anderson. Nice. So I'm a Wes Anderson fan yes, yes, and his style. Um, I really like directors. Yeah. more than specific movies. So I like certain directors, and I just like all of their movies. Yeah. So if you go by my desk, uh, you'll see a Steve Zissou Funko Pop from The Life Aquatic, which is also a Wes Anderson film. Yeah, that's a good one. But The Royal Tenenbaums is a kind of an ensemble cast. You've got Ben Stiller, Gene Hackman, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, Owen Wilson, Luke Wilson... Yeah. I'm trying to think who else is in there. Danny Glover's in there. Danny Glover. Angelica Houston. Angelica Houston. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing cast. Um yeah, it was his second big budget film, but his third actual movie because his low budget movie Bottle Rocket was actually his first movie. And then Rushmore and then Royal Tannenbaums. And it is my favorite of his films. It's a good flick. I did you know that that film has a Central Illinois connection. Ooh. Gene Hackman is from Dan. Yes, Gene Hackman is from Danville. I didn't. I didn't even did think I, about that. Did I know that or did I not know that? Oh, I can't remember. That's awesome, though. Yeah, and that was, it was funny. Whenever I was a kid, my dad said Gene Hackman was in the most movies of anyone ever, which I don't think was true. But he was in a lot of movies. And then one day he just kind of vanished. And we don't, we don't really know what happened. Yeah. I think he just said, I've done, I'm done. Yeah. I, I, I did I, enough movies. Yeah. I've, I've been in 400,000 movies. I will say, at one time I looked it up, and I think, uh, oh, heck, I can't remember his name. Uh, I think Michael Caine is up there. That's who I was thinking of. Yeah, Michael Caine. Michael Caine's movie list is nuts. It's insane how many movies he's done. Yeah. All right, my number four. I've got to get on my phone. Oh, yeah. Hey, Ron, it's the Big Lebowski. <laughs> That's right. Um so, yeah, speaking of directors we like, um, we mentioned the Coen brothers earlier when we were talking about Deb's list. Um, I've got The Big Lebowski on mine because it's a movie I love. Um, I don't know. It's it's funny. It's weird. It's got a weird plot structure. Um, it, it's easily the best thing. Um, oh, God, I can't think of names right now. But, yeah, it's got John Goodman. It's got uh, someone give me the main Jeff guy. Bridges. Jeff Thank Bridges. you, dear God. The Dude uh, Divides? Steve the Dude, yeah. Jeff Bridges, um, Steve Buscemi, um, and that European guy that's in everything and is always scary looking. And uh, so it's and it's just a weird little movie. It's like a guy's rug gets soiled, so he goes off to fix it. <laughs> and next thing you know, there's, uh, there's, there's this motley cast of bizarre, bizarre characters just running around doing stuff, and it's great. Um, but apparently our coworker Ron is not a fan of the film, so I apologize in advance to Ron for making my number four pick, The Big Lebowski. Oh, also, Philip Seymour Hoffman for the smarmy assistant to the real Mr. Lebowski. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the amazing Philip Seymour Hoffman. Before he, before he, he was kind of on the edge. Like, he was the guy people noticed him then but he wasn't really getting very big parts and it was it was not long after that that he was starting to really kick it and really take off that that movie is one of my favorites too if i wasn't doing this little theme it would be on the list for sure nice 
All right, Dave, what you got for, well, just, just whatever you want to do next. All right. Uh, the next film I want to talk about is Pleasantville. I never uh, watched that which one. Which is a, uh, what year, 1998 comedy starring uh, Toby McGuire, Jeff Daniels, and Eastern, uh, former Eastern student Joan Allen. Oh, cool. Also William H. Macy, J.T. Walsh, Don Knotts in one of his last film performances, I think. He was... Huh. Has to be yeah. pretty close, um, but uh, it's uh, it's set in, it's uh, set in the nineteen nineties. Uh, it's set in late nineties when the film was made. But these two high school students, played by Toby McGuire and Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> uh, playing brother and sister, um, somehow find themselves transported back to the mid nineteen fifties. Okay, and. Uh, all of the social mores and uh, blandness uh, of that time, as as uh, depicted in this movie, um, and uh, everything is in black and white. It's a, a TV show called Pleasantville, which is like the the, the Toby Maguire character in the night in the nineties in his real life likes to watch reruns of the show, wow. and he somehow ends up getting transported into that world uh, so. that he idealizes and finds out living in black and white with no passion and life is not so great after all. Yeah. Kind of an inverse Wizard of Oz, really. Yeah, kind of. That's it. That's it. I never made that connection that it goes from, instead of going from black, black and white, white to, to color, color, it goes the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's lots of, uh, of great performances. Joan Allen plays um, the mother, sort of the... Uh, June Cleaver type? June Cleaver. That's what I was trying to say, the June Cleaver type. Yeah, I can think of June Cleaver, but I can't think of Jeff Bridges, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say, I was trying to say June, but I, it was coming in my, coming up Joan or yeah. something like that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just an interesting sort of social um, uh, investigation of social mores. And um, uh, Reese Witherspoon plays the sort of uh, saucy... Uh, social butterfly character who really kind of stirs up the things in this black and white yeah. world. Um, and uh, the, the definitive fish out of water for the film. So it's it's a great uh, comedy with the, with the social message. Ah, nice. All right, Logan, number tres. Number three, No Country for Old Men. Ooh, that's a good one. And I believe that's another Coen that Brothers is, film. That is another Coen Brothers film, indeed. Although, we like our Coen Brothers films. Yes. Although I believe that one is actually based on a, a novel. It wasn't one of their original screenplays, right? Yes, yeah, so it's a Cormac McCarthy yeah. novel, which is a good novel as well. Um, I would uh, suggest reading Cormac McCarthy. Maybe not at this time. He's got a lot of dark themes. Yeah, uh, his stories, are, his books are pretty downerish, aren't they? Yeah, don't read The Road right now. Yeah. The Road is... Not not the time for the not road. Not the time for the apocalypse films. So, or so tell us a little bit about No Country for Old Men there, Logan. All right, so No Country for Old Men, it's there's two main uh I guess you'd say protagonists and antagonists. I would say the protagonist is uh by Josh Brolin, who plays uh Lou Ellen, and he stumbles upon a drug deal gone bad. And he finds a suitcase full of money. And so whenever one finds a suitcase full of a million dollars or so, naturally, one takes it. Right. And so then the Javier Bardem character is introduced. And he is the man on a mission to kind of set things straight. And so he is the antagonist known as Shigur. And he's kind of the hitman with zero conscience. And he's just kind of just on a mission to to get the money back and kind of set things in order. Yeah, he's he's a shark on human legs is what he is. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the image that always sticks with people is he's carrying around a uh, like a tank of pressurized oxygen and it's hooked up to, um, I believe it's a, it's a cattle killer, right? Yeah. And um, he uses that on people and it's not fun. And he has this strange, real odd haircut. Yeah. Kind of bowl cut looking. It's, it's a very 
It's one of those things like uh, the Coens had done dark before their, their first film blood simple was a very dark movie and it wasn't very funny. Um, but then they kind of started doing these kind of oddball comedies like raising Arizona and the big Lebowski and um, no country was sort of a, a going back to their roots um, with blood simple or uh, Miller's crossing, which was also a very dark gritty kind of film. But, but there's still those oddball elements like, like his ridiculous haircut and stuff that, that are just very Cohen. Like they just couldn't help themselves. And uh, I, it's a very strange film. It's kind of, kind of hard to understand at times why things are the way they are. Yeah. There's some, there's some things that happen that are very random almost, and it almost defies your typical story structure and it can kind of throw you. The ending especially is kind of like, you know, you're just kind of like, wait, what? So it's almost David Lynchian in that way, although not as weird as David Lynch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is a good comparison and we'll come back to that all right uh my number three by a different david i have a two-way tie or I have, a, I have a tie uh david cronenberg's naked lunch and videodrome if you have never seen either of these movies uh don't watch them if you have a weak stomach um but they're great um uh, i was talking to um, Logan the other day about this because I was explaining to him this is where the term Cronenbergian has come or Cronenberg has come from. Like some people have heard it from like Rick and Morty or other places, but they don't know what it means. And it's referring to the director David Cronenberg because he would make these films that were all about like body horror and people's bodies like shifting and warping and mutating. Um, he did the, here's another remake. He did the remake of the fly. Um, and in the original fly, um, a dude's head is switched with a fly's head. So, and that's it. It's just, you gotta, you gotta fly with the, a dude's head and a dude with a fly's head. And that's really the whole movie. I just, I have to interrupt. I just watched that recently. The original? The original. Yeah. Of, um, what's his name? The Vincent Price? Vincent Price. Why can't I say his name? Yeah. It's, 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 it's wonderfully campy. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. The <laughs> but, guy becomes a spider with the man's head on it. It's just so ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's pretty over the top. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the Cronenberg remake is not silly at all. It's it's very dark and gross. And, and basically this guy very slowly mutates into a giant fly. Like very slowly. Like it's not just, oh, I have a fly head now. Like for for two hours you watch this guy slowly, painfully transform into a giant fly and it is disgusting and amazing and i loved every second of it um but also he did <laughs> yeah jeff Wogelboom. Uh, that was kind of the first oh, yeah. really breakout role. yeah that was his breakout role before long before jurassic park and uh, but anyway um videodrome is a really weird movie that i can't even describe properly so i'm not going to bother it's really good but it's really really violent and really gross um but watch it anyway and then video, uh, Naked Lunch is an attempt to sort of kind of adapt um, William S. Burroughs' underground novel masterpiece, Naked Lunch. It's also really, really, really weird. Um, I didn't make it all the way through the first time I watched it. I, I had to shut it off because I was just like, okay, there's, there's too many writhing things going on here. I'm going to take a break. I had that experience in trying to read Burroughs' book. Uh, yeah, I, I had I a... Through it. Yeah, I had a Burroughs period where I was reading like all of his stuff and I would read a page every two days. Like that was that was my pace. Like normally I'm a speed reader, but Burroughs' books, I would read like one page, try to digest it and then not come back for like two days to a week. All right, Dave, what's next on your list? Oh, well, here's a major shift. 1953, From Here to Eternity. I know the name, but I've never yeah, seen it. It's uh, set... In Hawaii uh, in 1941, in the lead up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Oh wow! That's just sort of the, the setting, uh, and the you know the events are used to sort of dramatic backdrop, but not in a way to minimize it. But uh, right. So the the real thing is about the uh, the interpersonal dramas and the uh, the various characters. Uh, Montgomery Clift plays. Uh, a soldier who who transferred to Pearl Harbor and uh, his superior officer finds out that he had been a boxer and tries to force him to 
box. Um, and that's one of the one of the subplots. There's a, a romance between uh, and, a, and an affair between Deborah Carr and Burt Lancaster. And uh, Frank Sinatra is also uh, uh, has a, has a role in it. Huh. And uh, there's also uh, um, Ernest Borgnine is in it. Oh. And, uh, there's a, a dramatic uh, scene between them. Um, so it's really about all these people and the, the turmoil in their lives um, at the start of World War II. Right. And uh, Montgomery Clift uh, is uh, seen trying to escape from um, having killed a guy. And uh, mm. uh, at this, as he's as he's escaping, the, the, the Japanese start bombing the island. So, right. Um, and it's based on a novel by James Jones. He is from the Marshall, Illinois mm. area. Okay. He was uh, the main product of a of a writers' colony, the Handy uh, Writers' Colony, uh, guys who had aspirations to be writers and put them all in little cabins around property. Oh, yeah. It's sort of an interesting story. But uh, he came out of that and uh, is mostly known for the novel From Here to Eternity. And he, he wrote some other um, things, mostly uh, war-related titles. Uh, Thin Red Line is another one that uh, may be familiar. And this has the famous uh, beach uh, makeout scene between Burt Lancaster and Deborah Carr, where they're uh, they're like on the on the beach in black bathing suits, and the waves crash over them. Oh, okay, yeah. It's so a kind of an iconic uh, scene in uh, cinema history, uh, so I'm told. Hmm, cool. All right, what you got, Logan? Number two. Number two, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. 1982 film by Ridley Scott, and it's based on the book uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which uh, the basis for this film, I think it's the best sci-fi film of all time. It's my favorite sci-fi film. Um, So it's got Harrison Ford, who is a cop, and it's kind of, I guess, set in the future. And uh, his task is there's uh, kind of these replicants. So they are, they look like people, but they are not people. They are, um, I guess they'd say, like robots. And um, But these are people who, in some cases, they don't even realize. They believe they are actual people. So his task as a detective is to hunt down these uh, this group who have uh, escaped and murdered people, and they are very dangerous. And so he's kind of on this journey to track them down one by one and bring them to justice. But it's also a lot more complex. And there's a, in much the same way that Pleasantville is about morality and social mores, Blade Runner also, a lot of the film is about what it means to be human in many ways. Um, you know, what is the line between human and inhuman? And also, as, a, as another fun aside, um, the Rob Zombie song, More Human Than Human, takes its title from a line by Rutger Hauer in the film. Who Roy is... He's got the monologue at the end of the film, which is a great monologue as he is dying, talking about his short existence on this earth and what he's seen and what it means to be alive. So he may not be a human, but he considers himself alive and everything he has seen and experienced. So that is that's that's one of my favorite films. The, the, the thing that sticks with me is the the cinematography and the special yeah. effects and the you know the, the realism of the world. Yeah, there's some really great world building in that because um, that was I think I watched one of the because there's like eight cuts of Blade Runner, <laughs> and if you watch the wrong cut, you won't like it. And I watched the wrong cut the first time, but then I watched like the the widescreen director's cut or whatever. Yeah, director's cut's my favorite. Yeah, and it's like oh, it's so much better. And I was like, wow, this movie's great. Why did I think this movie sucked? I watched it on a small TV on a v- from a VHS. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite the right way to watch it, but it's good if you can still like it then. <laughs> All right. My number two. Um, we have not only the original Twin Peaks TV series, but we also have the Showtime Twin Peaks revival series. So we have all of Twin Peaks. Oh, and we have Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. So we have all, all, all of Twin Peaks. Uh, Twin Peaks, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, some of you may have watched it and don't know what it is. Um, That's me. Yeah. Um, Twin Peaks is about a town in Washington where a murder occurs. Laura Palmer is found dead, wrapped in plastic. 
So Special Agent Dale Cooper heads out to uh, try to solve the mystery. But, you know, things get weird because it's David Lynch TV show slash movie slash TV show movie thing. And it's fantastic and weird and makes absolutely no sense. And I love every second of it, uh, except for season two, which was kind of rough. But otherwise, the rest of it's really good. And um, I have ripped off the Red Room and my art a thousand times. And I will never stop ripping off the Red Room and my art until the day I die. So it's, it's one of my favorite things ever. And, um, it's, it's just, I can't even describe it. Like I said, it's supposed to be about a murder, but it's also about pie and coffee and a fish in the percolator and, uh, just a bunch of other crazy things. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. David Lynch is not really known for, uh, plot line for through plot lines. No. My first, uh, exposure to him was blue velvet, which is nice. Uh, yeah. I love blue velvet. A great movie. I, uh, God, the, the bad guy. What's Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. Ah, I made yeah, it. Dennis Hopper. Um, just Dennis Hopper. Maniacal performance. Dennis Hopper plays the most evil character in cinema history. He there are, if I watch it in just the right mood in in the dark with the lights off and I'm like just focusing on the movie, I, I start hallucinating and Dennis Hopper will start like dripping acid off of him. He's that evil it's and chilling. like just vicious in that film. It's amazing. It will stick with you if you see that performance. Oh yeah. All right, Dave. What you got? Okay, um, my next one is uh, an, another Eastern attendee from way back, Burl Ives. Uh, I figured we'd get to Burl Ives to get, sooner we, or later. We can't, we can't <laughs> talk about Eastern without Burl Ives, right? Gotta have Burl Ives in there. Um, which uh, he may be best known these days for singing Holly Jolly Christmas, which is on right. radio incessantly every Christmas season. Yep. Um, and, of course, he was Sam the Snowman in the... Uh, classic Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer TV Christmas special. Yep. And this movie is uh, The Big Country, which is a 1958 oh, Western okay. yeah. directed by William Wyler, starring along with Bro Lives Gregory Peck, Gene Simmons, and Charlton Heston. Hmm. It's a big cast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a yeah, Bro Lives won an Academy Award. That's why I chose this one, because he won his Academy Award for it, I think, for Best Supporting Actor. Oh, cool. Good for him. Papers. Yes, Best Supporting Actor. And it's it's sort of a classic Western where, you know, they're out on the out in the, the plains and uh, the, there are two families that are um, having a dispute over water rights and uh, land ownership and uh, things like that. And uh, Burl Ives plays the patriarch of one of these families, and the, his family is sort of the, the sort of uh, hard scrabble kind of not fancy living type people. Right. And the other, the the rival family are the ones who put on airs. They have a big mansion, and right. they have uh, uh, balls with all kinds of uh, you know pe- everyone dressed up and um, so on. So Burl Ives' big uh, scene is when he uh, busts into a fancy uh, dress ball at uh, the the rival family's mansion right. and uh, throws his shotgun down on the dance floor and uh, just has a, an amazing uh, uh, monologue, uh, just letting them letting them know what he thinks. So uh, cool. that's uh, it's it's uh, you know great performances and uh, if you're into westerns, uh, it's uh, definitely uh, one to see. And I made it through all of that without making any sort of Charlton Heston Planet of the Apes joke. I win. <laughs> all right. And, and Charlton Heston plays a bad guy, which I always ah, All right. Logan, I know what your number one is, so let's hit, let's hear that number one. Number one, The Empire Strikes Back. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> nice. 1980, directed by Irvin Kirshner. So it is the second in the Star Wars films, my favorite. It's just the best. It is, I like it better in uh, episode four personally. Uh, but it is all about where we where we left off with Luke, Han, and Leia. And then we're starting to see the Empire coming back after the Death Star is destroyed. Yep. And uh, yeah, the Hoth battle scene might be one of the, I mean, I guess I suppose it looks a little dated now, obviously, considering all the, the fancy crap we can do. But the, the Hoth battle scene to me is like one of the best 
battle scenes in cinema history, really. And then the rest of the movie's good, too. Boba Fett is introduced. Yep, Boba Fett shows up. I, I love Star Wars, but I, I have to admit to not knowing it as well as many people do. Hmm. But um, I Empire Strikes Back, is, is that the one with the... Uh, the uh, the land walkers yeah yeah, okay. yeah the, the, I love that the I love ice that battle. scene where they they fly and with the cable cables, around yeah, their yeah. legs yeah yeah, yeah that's a good the scene fall down the, the at 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 so that is that is my Star Wars nerddom coming out nice that's my number one film All right so my number one at our within within our library's collection obviously actually this is kind of my number one film depending on my mood. Um, Speaking of David Lynch, we have a copy of Eraserhead, everybody. And if you've never seen Eraserhead, you probably shouldn't because it's one of those films <laughs> you have to desire to want it because it is brutal. It, I tried it. I tried in, uh, in, yeah. in the early 90s, again, on a small TV on VHS, tried to watch Eraserhead. <laughs> yeah. I think I did watch it all. but Did you make it? Now. I, See, I think I did. I, I think I sat through it all, but I, I, I think I, I rewatched it a couple of years back and I was having trouble remembering how the movie ends because it's so overwhelming. Yeah. You remember the first 30 minutes because it's drilled into your brain, but after that it starts to get foggy because you can't handle it anymore. It's so broken and weird and amazing and it's all in black and white. It was David Lynch's first feature length film and it took him five years to make. Jack Nance who delivered the wrapped in plastic line I did earlier. Um, he stars in the lead role, which I don't think he even has a name. There's a, there's a fetus baby that will, will, that will haunt your nightmares forever. And it's, it's the best. That's all I remember is uh, the, the fetus, the fetus, baby, baby. The fetus after, baby. After all these years, that's what the, re- the reptile fetus with. baby will never leave you. Once you see the reptile fetus baby and, and you will hear its squall forever. So there's my top pick. All right, Dave, wrap us up, because we're actually running a little long this time. All right, well, I had one. Uh, I, I did Ball of Fire and Song is Born as a, uh, together uh, because they're the same plot, but the, the last one I have is uh, a little bit more recent com- compared to the stuff I've been talking about, The Ice Storm. I remember The Ice Storm. 1997, directed by Ang Lee, yep. another uh, dude with Illinois connections, although uh, not too um, Eastern. He went to University of Illinois in Urbana. Oh, cool. Starring Kevin Klein, Joan Allen with, you know, with her Eastern connections, Toby McGuire, Christina Ricci, Elijah Woods, Sigourney Weaver, all star cast, pretty much. Yeah. It's set in the early 70s. And oh, it's the early 70s? I couldn't yeah, remember. Yeah, I, I thought was, maybe, I thought, because I was born in an ice storm and I was born in 78 in February. So I thought maybe this was the same ice storm, but I, yeah. don't, I don't think it is. Well, I'm just, I, I would have guessed it. Uh, from my own recollection that it would have been later than this, but the the thing I have here says uh, it was set over Thanksgiving weekend, 1973. All right. Tell I would have what. guessed maybe 75, 77, something like that. But, you know, it's in the 70s. Yeah. It yeah. looks like the 70s. Oh, it looks like yeah. the 70s, and it feels like the 70s. And So anyway, it's, it's basically um, a bunch of, well, it's, it's two families, uh, made up of a, a bunch of really messed up people yeah. who uh, are doing all kinds of things that are not good for them no. and are kind of lost yeah. it, and don't know what to do about it, um, which sounds really depressing, and it is. But, yeah, no, it's, it's, not a, it's not a fun, heartwarming film by any stretch. It's, um, it's, it's sad. It's very sad. Uh, the performances are, are remarkable. I yeah. think it was the first movie I saw Elijah Wood in. Yeah, I, I think it was, yeah, it was before the Lord of the Rings movies came out. Yeah. And he was, he, cause he had had, wasn't he in like a, he was like a child star, but then he kind of vanished and then, then he kind of just came yeah. back and it was like, oh, this guy can act. Okay. Let's, let's let him, let's let him back in. Yeah. And he was, he, he, he the first time he was ever on my radar, I think was when I saw him in this movie. Yeah. Uh, Joan Allen plays uh, a mother, which just seems to be a uh, a recurring role for she, her. She's typecast. Yeah, sort of a an unhappy mom in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. She's she's very unfulfilled. Well, that's the thing. Everybody's unfulfilled in the movie, and that's what leads them to do all the the not smart things that they do, and all the how their lives get kind of wrecked. So it's a, what's one thing that's fascinating about it is the sort of surreal um, setting. It just feels through as you're watching it. It feels like something is not right yeah. you know, the whole time. Kind of like you, if you've 
lived through an ice storm, you go outside and it's all quiet and everything's covered with ice and it's yeah. just, just things sound different and it's sort of like they're just in this bubble where their lives are not going well and they don't and they're kind of frozen into it to maybe stretch the metaphor a little too far that's very good though um, i like that I it's like, like that. they're stuck and they don't know what to you know in, in these patterns in their life and they don't know how to get out of it so right anyway yeah it's not an uplifter but it's uh it is a, a it's a good flick. It's a great character study and uh you know the, the uh, imagery is, is uh, very beautiful cool all right, so that I do have one honorable mention though. All right, give us our honor. What you got? What you got, Logan? So David Bell has been talking about ones with ties to Eastern and Charleston. Uh-huh. There's actually I'm a Western fan as well. There's the movie The Searchers. Oh yeah, yeah. Which has John Wayne and right. is loosely based on the story of Cynthia Ann Parker. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Who grew up outside of uh, Charleston, and her family moved down to Texas. They were to start a fort down there. They were attacked by Comanches, and uh, she was actually kidnapped by the Comanches as a child and grew up with them and uh, married a chieftain and had children with them. And then uh, she was later... uh, Found by Texas Rangers and uh, and brought back. I, d- I did not know that, but that is that is interesting, and uh, that's a that's a neat little connection. I should have come up with connections to EIU too, but I am lazy. <laughs> well, I learned about that when we uh, had an exhibit about that whole story a few years ago. But the the movie The Searchers I saw in a film class when I was in college. It's a, a very well known and uh, it's it's my favorite John Wayne movie. film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like the it's the critically acclaimed John Wayne film. Like like when I was a kid, all the you, I never watched. I never saw The Searchers until I was in a cinema appreciation class in college too. It was one of those things. Like it wasn't the it wasn't one of the popular movies, mm-hmm. but yeah, like the critics love it. Yeah. So it's 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 interesting to learn that there's a, a local connection to the story behind that. Yeah. All right. So hopefully we have given you plenty of. Plenty of things that you can check out from the media section here at the Booth Library on the fourth floor. Uh, Talk to Ron or Logan or one of the many student workers. And if the student workers look like they're slacking, uh, report them to Ron and Logan. (laughs) 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 All right, this has been the the Booth Library podcast media episode. I'm Joseph Morse. I'm Logan Braddock. I'm David Bell. Have a nice day. Thank you.